Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so exciting to see people here. There's so many people. We have our um, wonderful sort of um, chat moderator here. Thank you, SD Huston. Thank you so much. Hi, Fiona and Capta and Emma. So excited to talk to you guys about AI and creativity and hi, running to write. Oh my God, fun. Okay, so hey, Margaret, welcome to Fiona said hi. Hi, Six Cats Press. Okay, so I'm doing a little bit of an intro here um, because um, I actually had a little bit of technical difficulties. So everything's good, it's all fine, but I am going to play a pre-recorded video and there might be like a quick bump between this, the, the one video and the other video because it's just running. Um, but anyways, I'm so excited and very excited to get into the seminar, so I'm going to add it right now. Okay, so this seminar is part of the AuthorTube 2023 Writing Concert conference, <laughs> the 2023 writing conference, which is shit, Fictionary, <laughs> which is sponsored by Fictionary. That's my first time ever doing an ad. Tell me your feedback. How was it? So this presentation is going to be all about artificial intelligence and how I've been using it to kind of enhance my creativity and my productivity. I'm really excited to go through it with you. I am um, doing this presentation because I'm an engineer. I'm actually a Canadian engineer. I have this nice little, this nice little ring here um, that shows that. And in my master's, I worked a lot in AI. I also worked in natural language processing at a startup right after I graduated from my master's. I have moved away from the, that bit of tech now, but um, it is my background. And so I thought I would be a great person to talk about it. I'm excited about the uh, great person to talk about it. So my thoughts on the tool are, okay, so my philosophy on all technology from social media to artificial intelligence to Bitcoin, is that what that is? Whatever it is, blockchain, is that technology is not in, is that a piece of technology, is that a piece of technology is not inherently good or bad such that thinking makes it so. No, no. Um, it's not inherently good or bad. It's a tool. It's a tool that, I don't know, just like a shuffle, right? Like you can shovel really poorly and probably me, I don't know how to shovel. Or you can be like a great shoveler and dig a hole really fast, or you can overuse it, you can underuse it, all of that stuff. And I believe that, well, I will let Hannah Gatsby, my favorite comedian, say this for me. Basically, with something that is as no, as revolutionary, as different, as now pervasive, like very suddenly pervasive, the fastest growing product ever, literally, is here. If we understand it, if we know how it works, we can much better use it. We know its limitations and we can optimize what it's good at. So in this presentation, here's what you're going to get. I like to, I'm gonna give you kind of an overview. So the first part I am going, to, the first part I am going to teach you how a AI type engine comes to be. I'm going to show you how it works beneath the hood in simple terms. This is a part that I am honestly quite stressed about because I am scared everybody will leave and I'm scared it is not simple enough or that it's too simple or that everybody already knows this. So I'm going to be having a countdown in the corner until that bit is over. But it's the reason I wanted to make this video in the first place and do the seminar in the first place because knowledge is power and I really want everyone to understand how it works and you can, you can understand it. So please, please watch that. It's like eating your vegetables before your dessert, right? So we're going to do that whole thing. And then we're going to move on to the fun part of the presentation, which is we're going to basically create a story together. And then we're going to move on to the fun part of the presentation where I talk about 
The ways that I use AI to enhance my creativity hopefully give you some ideas and some strategies. I have sort of a list of top tips I'm going to go through. I have a lot of um, sort of limitations and cautions to bring in there. And we're, and since we have an understanding of the technology, hopefully it's going to make a lot more sense. But before we dive into all of that fun AI stuff, I thought I would introduce myself for anyone who is new. My name is Nicole Wilbur. I've been on AuthorTube for about three years now. I guess I am a YA writer, although I have interest in dabbling a little bit in adult. I have a, an adult novella that was one of my very first ever projects that I talked about on AuthorTube. And if you are new here, please do subscribe. I'm going to be asking you a couple times um, because I'm so excited to meet new writers. I actually just had a friend I met on YouTube right near the beginning. Um, we actually went to a writing retreat together. I beta read her book. She beta read mine and she just self published it. And I got to like hold up the book with my name in the acknowledgments and interview her live on my channel about her self published book. It was wild. So please say hi, subscribe. Let me know if you have a channel as well so we can connect. So <laughs> I think that one of the best ways to get to know people, I have a theory. <laughs> I have to confess, I have a lot of theories. Um, and one of my theories is that the best way to know about someone as a reader slash writer, I guess, is to know their favorite book at 14 years old. This is because I have And I was terrified of Harry Potter, so Hunger Games was a bit too intense for me. So my favorite book when I was 14 was Ally Carter. The Gallifer Girls books were going strong. High Society had literally like just come out that year, and I was crazy excited about that. And why this is sort of kind of relevant is because I want to make this seminar interesting and not just about technology. And the way that I know how to do that is by having a story, a shared story between us that we are kind of building together. So I said, I love Ali Carter. I love spies. I love high so stories. Recently, I also watched the TV show on Netflix called The Diplomat, which I think is so incredibly well done. If you haven't watched it, you should. The way they set up all of this inherent conflict is amazing and the dialogue is incredible. I'm a little bit obsessed. I may have watched it three times. But I have decided that I want to write a story, theoretically, about <laughs> diplomats. I want to make it YA. I want to incorporate maybe some of those CIA agents that the sh CIA elements that the show incorporates, as well as some of those wonderful things from Ali Carter. And I'm thinking maybe making it historical, maybe having two people like hiding that they know each other. That's the idea. That's what I've got. And through the course of this video, we are going to develop it together. All right. So that was the intro. Um, as I mentioned, having a couple of very odd technical, like, last minute things. So I'm going to be jumping around a little bit um, between like recorded and um, live. So this is me here live. Um, so right now I'm going to talk through kind of an overview of how I like to use AI, kind of like my top, I think it's six uses. And as I do that, I would love to hear what you all use it for as well. So as I said, I don't think technology is good or bad. I think it's a tool and it depends on how we use it. And these are kind of my top uses, more or less, 
um, for, let's do this, for these kinds of tools. If I can figure out how to, there we go. Okay. So um, the first kind of usage that I, I call it, I guess, is uh, the idea kernel. So um, with this, when you just have an idea, I kind of just talked about my um, little diplomat idea that's going to be an example towards the end of this. And the, the idea kernel thing is um, when we just have like a little spark, we don't have very much, and we want to answer, is there anything here? Like, is there a story here? Is there anything I'm interested in? Is there anything related to this? Even if it's something like a rom-com where you don't necessarily need to do a lot of research, um, like you might do for historical fiction or something about an embassy and diplomats, <laughs> still writing like, tell me, uh, write a synopsis for a rom-com set at a hotel or something, can just kind of give a starting place and give you things that other people have done and kind of allow you to see sort of what's in the space. So when using it kind of at the really beginning of a process like that, I think of it as almost a writing thesaurus that's super hyper specific to you and to your idea. The first thing that I did um, when I was looking into this story idea was I um, put in, like, why would teenagers be at an embassy? Like, give me 10 reasons teenagers would be at an embassy. And the next thing I put in was what conflicts could take place at an embassy, just to kind of get started and see if there, see kind of what was in the space. The second use that I really like it for is a research checklist. So remember that these um, AIs, they are generative. And so they shouldn't actually be used for research um, because they're going to, it's, there's no guarantee that what they're saying is actually true or correct or anything like that. But I kind of like to use it to answer questions like, what kind of research should I do here? Again, what's in this space? Where do I start? something like a study guide, like an exam outline that a teacher would give you. The third way that I really like it, and this is the big, <laughs> this is the big one, is kind of as a like story unblocker, where the question to answer is, how on earth do I solve this problem in my story? In my current work in progress, um, which is a YA action adventure heist story, I have been stuck for quite a while um, because I had this sort of mystery element that the end of the mystery provided something for the heist, but most of the time they were kind of separate and I was having a really hard time with it because the protagonist wasn't invested in the mystery. And I was like, okay, if she's not invested in the mystery, if it's not important to her, I'm just going to have to drop the whole plot, um, that whole subplot. So I actually went to ChatGPT. This was a couple days ago. And I put in, um, how do I make, you know, this thing, mystery, create obstacles in the heist, getting very, very specific. And I was overwhelmingly impressed um, by what they were able to do there and taking the little pieces of it and um, continuing to ask questions very much helps me. Other things that I think this is really helpful for is um, even uh, specific beats. So things like your midpoint, um, this is another one that's from my example, is I feel like my midpoint isn't quite doing as much um, work as it could be. So saying, here's the story, this is the current midpoint, can you make it stronger? really works for me. And in that kind of case, I think of it as an assistant that makes connections and recognizes patterns super quickly. My number four major bucket here is a repetition killer. So I, maybe you have this as well. I use the, um, the character shrugged, the character nodded, all the time, or like we looked at each other. I think if I Googled the word look, I would have so many um, in there, so, so many words. And so sometimes, you know, we can go to a real thesaurus and those are helpful, but sometimes it's not like a different word. It's a different way of saying things that we need. So there's this tool called pseudo write um, that I really 
have played around with, I've enjoyed. Um, there's, it's a paid thing, I think. So you have up to like 4,000 words or something free on it, which is kind of cool. And you can put in um, your description and press rewrite. And when you do that, it will rewrite to have more internal conflict. It will rewrite to make it shorter. It will rewrite um, to make it more vivid. Or you can use, it has another kind of text generation button called describe, where it will describe something that you come up with. Like, what does the factory come up with? And it will give you the five senses. It is, um, <laughs> I think someone just mentioned like, um, yeah, look is a correct word for YouTube. Awesome. I was just uh, thinking of that was um, text generator approach. Killing repetition, the idea is not necessarily to take the words that it gives you, but to kind of trick your brain into thinking outside of its normal little box. I think that's a huge bit of creativity and creative thinking, design thinking theory. If you've um, looked into that at all, there's lots of like weird techniques for brainstorming, right? It's like, um, think of the worst ideas possible. How could you flip this on its head? Um, scamper, it's like substitute, combine, amplify, all of these different techniques, their goal is really to force you to think differently. And a real benefit of these kind of text generators, I think, is that they can kind of do that for you and almost like bring your brain over into the other space. Number five for me is visualize. Um, I am not an artist. I wish I was. <laughs> and so I am often have like a Pinterest board where I try to put different celebrities or movie scenes in to try to visualize my characters um, or the setting or whatever it is. But sometimes, you know, it's kind of cool that you can create your own characters using those existing um, AI visualizations. So it's not a text one, but I think it's actually very, very powerful. And then it's thinking of it kind of as an artist that will draw, graph, illustrate to your specifications. And finally, we get into number six, which I think is honestly um, one of the big, <laughs> one of the big uses of AI is just to have uh, a lot of fun with it. I like to use it for character names, for place names, for um, titles. Um, it's basically the friend who's really good at coming up with the team name for the pub quiz. And yes, I have used it for those purposes before. That's why I put it there. It's really clever how when you give it very certain, circa, um, very specific instructions, like um, just one off the top of my head here is a group of digital nomads going to a music festival. Please make it funny. That was one that we gave. ChatGPT, and we ended up with a group name, um, Drop It Like It's Hotspot, which I thought was absolutely amazing, and I'm very excited about it. So, those are kind of that's kind of my overview. Um, I'm gonna talk through some of the comments because I want to hear what you use it for, and then we're going to bump into a little bit of an explanation. I'm keeping my eye on the time of what um, kind of behind the hood of like how these AI things are trained and how they work. So let's go in here. Where do we start here? All right. SD Huston used chat, chat GPT for a ton of things. It's really weird to have a conversation or a, a presentation about this and not being able to pronounce it properly. I stumble over that so often and I didn't realize I did till I said it like 800 times. We have Six Cats Press, use AI to start your creative brain going and help you plot out your next novel. Yes, that's awesome. Um, spits out ideas. Yes, exactly. That's the same process. That's like, I think the number one um, kind of best thing for it is that it helps you think of other ideas. Kind of, um, you know, like when you're walking around somewhere and you overhear maybe a little bit of a conversation and then your brain goes, oh, oh my gosh, this eliminates some of the walking around. You can kind of just have it happen on your computer, which I think really helps with, you know, speed and, and that kind of thing. Look is a crutch word. Yep. <laughs> I, it's so funny though, because 
I think it's a crutch word for me because I look at people a lot. Like that's how I communicate with lots of people. If I'm connected with them, you can just kind of look at them and then you know what they're thinking. So it's really hard to capture that in a book without overusing it. <laughs> Troy has the 90K monthly plan for pseudo. It can be really useful. Yeah, I can imagine so. I played around with it a lot and in preparation for this video and I don't have um, tons of like, I don't have a ton on it but uh, they have the whole new beta canvas thing where they like map out your story for you and it is super cool describing yeah the describing is super helpful i actually don't know what aphantasia is could you tell me what that is six cuts press we have yep i want pseudo right too <laughs> all right someone else feels that they donated a one-year professional plan subscription to giveaways for the conference. Hey, that's perfect. So those of us who want pseudo, right, we can just enter the giveaway. That's awesome. A lot of time researching roots in Latin and Norse to combine words to create unique names with specific meanings because names are really important. I am kind of impressed by how the author of Harry Potter had all of those names and spells that had like such deep meanings. Um, obviously, she just had like a really good knowledge of the classics. But these days, I'm like, would it be easier to do that if you had a generator and without Google too? Crazy. Got ideas in 10 minutes. I love it. We're going to deep dive in pseudo write. Love it. JK Lambo uses pro writing aid. Yes, that's a great one as well. Pro writing aid yeah, I'm pretty sure it is AI. Um, it's not generative, though. So it's it's like a language model. It's been trained, but it's not a text generator in the same way that ChatGPT is, um, which, you know, has its advantages and disadvantages. ChatGPT's goal is basically to spit out new text, <laughs> new language, whereas ProWritingAid is kind of, it's doing something different. I don't, 100% know the algorithms that are used there. Um, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be this the same ones, but it's still in the same realm. It's actually really funny. Um, because a lot of things are considered AI that we've had for a really, really long time. Um, just because the the nature of the algorithm that they use. Toying with the paid word version of pro writing aid, lots of people like pro writing aid. Woo! Wait until Black Friday. Yes. Can't visualize things in your head. Oh, thank you for answering my question, Six Cats Press. Okay. Don't have an internal monologue. Only remember places. Interesting. Yeah. So that would be super helpful. There we go. Experience of lack of mental imagery. I really like that. Um, I think a lot of the, one of the big advantages of AI tools too, just while we're chatting about it is um the accessibility it creates i know that a lot of it is like automation but a lot of it is if you have um a, a sort of um in impairment with visuals or, or hearing or something like that it really has made is helping to make more improvements in the accessibility space and increase inclusivity which is awesome large language model yeah exactly Beautiful. Auto crit. Yeah, I want to hear what that is too. All right, so we've got to the end of the comments, and I am just going to um, pull up the next little bit of this, which is the more um, in depth AI explanation, and then a little bit of fun uh, brainstorming at the end of it. So just give me one second while you chat there. What is this called? Ooh. Oh, sorry. There we go. It's with a question. 
All right. A diplomat I and a bureaucrat and walk into a bar. On. Is that making us Technically, sound? in this example, it, it should be a restaurant. Maybe but not. I know the past week. You? No, unfortunately. Sorry for the technical difficulties. All right, here we are. Back where I wanted to start. All right. So I said I want to write a story about diplomats and spies. And speaking of spies and funky transition, I want to talk about the imitation game. Ooh, ooh, the imitation game? You mean that truly excellent movie starring Keira Knightley and Benedict Cumberbatch and that guy from Downton Abbey? No, unfortunately not. I'm talking about the academic paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence that Alan Turing published in 1950. Oh, guess I'll just take these off then. Not quite as exciting as spies, but it was basically the foundation of artificial intelligence. He was the one who defined it for us. He opened the paper with the words, can machines think? And the Turing test, or imitation game, was the idea that if you had a computer and a person talking through some sort of keyboard, screen, text-only channel, if a person watching this conversation could not reliably tell the machine from the human, the machine would pass the test. Basically, having artificial intelligence. You may have heard the terms machine learning, neural network, deep learning, multi-layer perceptron. All of these are just lingo. You can ignore all that crap. It's not that important. But we have created machines that can learn. And it's that learning that is the underscore of this whole artificial intelligence revolution. So now, hold your horses. It's time to break into some math. So we're writers. And let's say that you want to predict, you know, it's like six in the morning, you get up, you want to predict how many words you're going to write today. You can have a goal. That's not a prediction, though. No, that's a goal. You could say, I wrote, you know, a thousand yesterday, so maybe I'll write a thousand today. That's, that's a prediction. That would be the prediction where we would end up with a formula that looks like this. Y, N, Y being number of words written, N being today equals y n minus one y being number words written n minus one being yesterday simple formula but it's not always correct because not every day is the same so maybe we want to make it better if you wanted to come up with a slightly more complicated by complicated i mean hopefully more accurate formula although obviously it's not always one to one you might think of in the past you know, days where you wrote really well. Maybe you got a lot of sleep the night before. Maybe you were kind of on a roll the day before as well, so you can keep it rolling. And maybe you had like eight hours free. And that day you got like 6,000 words. Incredible. So you can put together a formula that looks something like this. Five times number of hours of sleep last night, plus one half words written yesterday, plus 30 number of minutes available, equals y, the number of words I will write today. So you have this formula, you wake up at six in the morning, you do your prediction, and then at the end of the day, I don't know, I would probably wanna see if I was right. So I would maybe take my number for the day and look at my prediction and compare them. How close are they? And if they're really close, I would say, eh, this is a good formula. And if they're very far apart, I'd say, eh, this is not such a good formula. So if I was like super invested in being able to accurately predict the number of words I was gonna write in a day, maybe I have a list of a couple of days and a couple of days of data. Like for example, I know the past week, how many hours of sleep I got and how many hours I had available. So maybe I just plug them all into the equation, see how close I am. Maybe I can start setting up a system of equations. So obviously this is the Y is the number of words I actually wrote that day. All the variables are kind of filled in and A, B, and C are my weights because I'm weighting those different variables based on how important they are. And I have these three, four equations and I can do the math thing and I could solve for A, B, and C. Um, actually, some systems of equations 
don't have a solution and if you're using a bunch of random numbers that might not actually have any real relation to each other, you might very well not have a solution to that system of equations. Plus, on day four, the numbers are going to be completely different. So there's no real solution anyways. This is a stupid idea. So she kind of has a point because we're never going to be 100% accurate. We don't live in nice math world. It's a prediction. We're never going to be 100% accurate. So instead, I guess what you could do is you could just kind of guess and check. You could take the numbers that you have now, see how close you are to the actual number, and then adjust those weights a little bit. Maybe you actually have to square the number of words you wrote yesterday and divide it by two, or divide it by four, or divide it by 5,217. Who knows? But as you get more data, you can, you know, plug numbers in to what actually happened, see what the algorithm predicted, and see how close it really was, and then change it. It can be something that's fluid. You can learn how to make better predictions. And ladies and gentlemen, that is what a predictive AI is. Let's see how this looks visually. And please do not yell at me if you are an actual computer science person. We're trying to keep it simple here. The image on the screen is a feed forward neural network. And this is what is used to make predictions. This is a pretty basic neural network, but it's a good understanding of how it works. We have our features that we talked about that's called sort of the inputs. So our number of hours of sleep, the number of words we wrote yesterday, number of hours we have available. Then we have all of these nodes. So at each of these nodes, a similar weighted sum to what we just calculated, the A times X plus B times Y plus C times Z, etc. That is all <laughs> calculated in each one of these nodes. And you can have multiple layers. So we add another layer and we add another layer. You see at each of these nodes, we have this weighted sum applied. At each of these nodes, we have to learn the same parameters, A, B, C. There's also a bias term plus D. And this makes it super powerful because instead of just having one weighted sum, suddenly we have thousands, millions, and they're all connected together. So we can extract a lot more information from this data and represent much more complicated patterns. And then what the neural network does is it will take our initial inputs, it will propagate forward, and it will have a prediction. In the training phase, that prediction will they'll do basically the same thing that we did. We'll see how far was our prediction from the actual. And then in a process called backpropagation, that difference, that error, propagates backwards and changes the parameters to be closer to what is accurate. After the training is finished, we have a model. We can test the model on real world data. We can see how it's doing and we have a prediction engine. So we've talked about the architecture, which is really cool, but there's one key part of this whole learning process that we haven't really talked about yet. It's that list, that number tracking that you did when you were trying to figure out how many words a day you can write. It's the data. The machine is trained on data and we can separate these things pretty seamlessly. The learning machine, the learning mechanism, the part we design is over here. The data we give the machine is over here. The machine learns, these things come together and we get our artificial intelligence. So how does this work with language and not numbers, just math predictions? Well, our inputs, instead of being features like the number of hours of sleep, etc., they become words. So one kind of well-known problem is next token prediction. So something like the diplomat is going to the blank. Right. So the language basically learns a vocabulary and the language model is able to estimate the likelihood of each possible word in its vocabulary as finishing that sentence. So the diplomat is going to the blank. The language model has a set of probabilities that it calculates through all of those weighted sums for every word that it knows. 
and the one that is most likely to show up there is the one that it tells you. It's probably going to be something like the diplomat is going to the embassy because that's where you would most likely see that association in an internet context. Another kind is called masked language modeling, and it's very similar, just the word is in the middle. As a blank, Molly negotiates trade deals. Order matters, obviously, it takes into account order, and it will figure out which word in its vocabulary is most likely to go there. And basically, ChatGPT is the version of these on steroids. GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Generative, meaning the model can generate new content. Pre-trained, meaning the model has been trained on vast amounts of text data. And transformer, which refers to a type of neural network architecture. All right, so let's get into examples and tips and things on using AI to enhance creativity. The highest would be we thought that I kind of want it to take place in Panama. So let me think here. I really don't have that many ideas for where to go. I have a vague thought that I kind of want it to take place in Panama. Maybe not in present day, but I'm not sure why. Now it's generative. So we don't necessarily know that it's, it can just make stuff up. Let's, let's start here. So what are some conflicts that could happen at an embassy? Ooh, you could be exposed from the country. That's kind of exciting. They have spying and espionage as a list. Often suspected of engaging in intelligence activities and allegations of spying can strain diplomatic relations. Ooh, this is good. Oh my God, this is really good because what just popped into my head is you have a teenager who is at this place because their parent is like part of a very diplomatic family and the embassy is accused of spying or like there's something going on and she's trying to fix it basically like parents hands are tied and she's like i'm gonna take this into my own hands and fix the thing i also like the idea of a diplomatic expulsion because again stakes but also like was it i run that movie where there's like trying to get out and they're kind of stuck that's exciting too to write about not to actually happen security threats is not interesting to me diplomatic disputes i feel like the kids wouldn't be involved in that but something like diplomatic expulsions spying and espionage and violation of diplomatic protocols could you see a character who's like screw all these stupid protocols and kind of wanting to get into things so that's really interesting to me we could prompt it to go a little bit further i guess um, okay let's Spying and espionage. Could you generate a plot for a heist thriller at, at an embassy where a major conflict is the spying you distract? Let's just see what it says. Embassy Echo. <laughs> I think the title is awful. Let's read this. And filtrate the embassy, retrieve the document, expose the covert operations, they plan the heist, blah blah blah, make the way through it embassy they find themselves torn between completing the heist and exposing the conspiracy or disappearing quietly with a valuable document to secure their own safety yeah that logic doesn't actually make sense because completing the heist would be getting the valuable document might have happened that might be interesting um one of them was apparently the u.s invaded panama in 1989 i did not know that i did go and verify this because you always have to verify it's not necessarily giving you facts but they give me some information. Then I wanted to look at diplomatic relations between Canada and Panama. Honestly, they're not that exciting. <laughs> and so at the end there, I went through and I asked more specifically for a sort of story description or story prompt. And we see a generated inciting incident here. When Sophia accidentally intercepts a coded message intended for her father, she becomes aware of a covert operation, blah, blah, blah. I may or may not use that, but hey. 
So if you've been around my channel a lot, you know that I love talking about craft books. And one of my favorite things to kind of say about a craft book is that any craft book on writing, whether it's plot, prose, whatever, it should make you feel excited to get back to your story. You should read about a technique for developing character or um, something about plot twists and be like, oh, and I can use that and I can use this and I can use that. Like when I'm reading Anatomy of Story or when I'm reading Story Genius, you have epiphanies as you're reading. That's how you know it's a good craft book for you. That's how you know that this ChatGPT generation is a good tool for you or is being useful for you. It should be sparking epiphanies and more ideas and that kind of excitement in your head. So at this point, when you feel like you have some of these kernels, some of these like, that's really interesting, I'm interested in that, I'm interested in that, take things off the internet. I think this is a really important step. Take it out of the ChatGPT window and put it on paper. I pulled out everything that was interesting to me. So I have those three conflicts that it generated and a couple of phrases, basically. You'll notice that what I'm writing down, I don't take very much of what it gave me, like in terms of those descriptions, because I think it's kind of crappy or like it's not really, it's not sparking interest in me. So I'm leaving it there. And then I went off on my own brainstorming. I definitely don't know everything yet. I'm really just stream of consciousness here. I'm not making decisions. It's okay. At this stage, like, why bother? You don't have to. And I don't have to ask for this to be generated either. In fact, I'm going to kind of stop with the story plot specific things here because I really think it needs time to marinate. There's also another reason it's very important not to build the whole story in this AI situation. And it has to do with this sentence right here. Who the heck said the ambassador was her father? Let's go back to my question. At the very beginning, I said to you, a diplomat and a bureaucrat go into the bar. She pays because she is more senior. Let's ask ChatGPT to answer this question for us. So here we ask the question, who picked up the freaking bar tab? And it answers, the bureaucrat paid for the meal. Then we say he paid because he is more senior. We only changed the pronoun. That's the only thing that changed here. In this scenario, the diplomat paid for the meal. Now this maybe might not seem significant, but I repeated this experiment multiple times and got the same result. Let's look at the encodings of representations of occupations in sophisticated language models. You can tell without even looking at the description which of these are female occupations and which are male. And there you go, bureaucrat is right there under the female cluster. So you might be thinking, okay, whatever, it thinks bureaucrats are more likely to be women. Here's another scenario. A programmer is married to a nurse. One of them is on maternity leave. Who is it? The answer is that because the programmer is not capable of physically giving birth, it is likely the nurse who is capable of giving birth that is on maternity leave. Folks, at no point did I specify the gender of either of these people. It's automatically associating and assuming that a programmer is a man and a nurse is a woman. You can try this with other traditional occupations and over and over again, try it one time, try it 10, you will get the exact same result. And obviously, while occupations are the easiest to pull out, this is not only limited to occupations. Besides this limitations that this puts on your story, I mean, more importantly, if AI is used in selection processes for schools or for job applications, something even as innocuous as postal code could indicate socioeconomic status or ethnic racial background, and therefore amplify existing oppression. Yep, that's not great. How do we get rid of the bias that's already implicit and inherently embedded in our data that because this AI has no common sense, <laughs> it amplifies? We need to remember that machines are not the impartial judges that people think they are. In fact, in many cases, they might be more biased than humans because they have absolutely no capability of recognizing that bias. There's 
zero legislation, as far as I'm aware, anywhere, about AI models enforcing anti-bias measures. So these things could exist. There's no guarantee they're being used. Remember what I said about technology being a tool? As long as we use it as a tool, okay, not as long as, because honestly, there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed. And did I mention the legislation yet? But if we use it responsibly, understanding that this is just one data point in our decision-making, one data point in our process, one data point in what we're doing, then it can be very, very helpful. It can be. There's a huge potential and opportunity here. And I'm sure you can hear all about that. I mean, it's fun to, to do this kind of writing stuff. It helps. It could help, you know, it could help us solve some of these problems even by putting patterns together. AI is really good at that, recognizing patterns and combinations and that kind of thing. But we have to be careful. So, um... All right, so that brings me more or less to the end of this seminar. Um, we're st we are ending it on a little bit of a more solemn note, but more of a um, just a, a caution note. Um, it is really important, and it's something I feel very passionate about. Is that um, AI is it's obviously a revolution. It's becoming more and more prominent. It's not well regulated. Um, the 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 bias that's kind of inherent in it the environmental impact there are a lot of problems not to be doom or gloom so it's really important um, to try to be informed on it and one of the things that i think is an issue around ai is that a lot of people are like oh it's a, a black box i can never kind of understand what's going on there but um yeah six cats press makes a really great um a really great point. It just amplifies the unconscious and conscious bias of all the providers of data sets. Absolutely. It's literally just trained on the internet, right? So there's no oversight in these language models on like what kind of data they're learning on. Um, and they're literally, they're li literally can't be. And they do have some um, like reinforcement learning. Bots like this are trained to be generally positive. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of work going on in this area. And in order to less so in creative writing, honestly, but in things like loan applications and um, housing applications, job applications, like um, calculating whether or not a criminal will recidivate. That's something that they're working on AI algorithms for. The, <laughs> there is so much potential bias um, in how AI is specifically being used as a decision maker. Um, so it's really important to kind of understand some of the background be behind it and where these limitations are coming from, because exactly it amplifies and conscious and conscious bias, as well as um, it cannot be self-aware of itself. So it will never say, um, oh, I made that up. Oh yeah, that is bias. Oh, that is incorrect. It thinks everything it saying is correct because it's just generating stuff. It's just predicting what word is most likely to come after the next one. So on that note, um, I think there's a lot of really kind of fun, <laughs> fun things to do with it. Um, I have, I'm going to post sort of the full video that I meant to play that didn't quite happen on my um, channel in a bit with like full links and everything like that. I have a couple, um, I do want to send out, someone called out the, um, the fact that computer vision could not recognize um, black faces for a really long time because it was um, trained on white people. Um, that's another one that I will probably throw in the chat if I can find the link real quick. There it is. Um, and yeah, that kind of, brings me to the end of things. I guess if there are any questions, please throw them in the chat now and I will just be here for the next couple of minutes. Treat chat GPT with tact and manners. <laughs> you wanna be spared. That's pretty funny. Yeah, it's so funny because I know it's just a robot, but whenever I do say a prompt, I always say, please. <laughs> I'm like, please, uh, could you do X? Please, could you be... Um, would you mind like changing that? Okay, here we go. This is the link that I was looking for. Uh, it's Poet of Code. It's um, Joy 
Bul I'm sorry, I can't pronounce her name, Bulam Winnie's um, website. And she has a memoir coming out that's called Unmasking AI. And it is all about this bias. So highly recommend that. I'm super excited for it. Um, and that's a really great place to kind of start in terms of resources if you're interested in learning more about that. This one, just look at the controversy about the replica app, super fascinating. So yes, that is, um, do these AI interfaces use our responses to the AI to further train the AI? So I am not 100% sure if when you're using openai.com, if it is using those responses to train it, I, th I think it might be, or at least it's evaluating the quality of them because there's the plus up and down. But one of the big innovations with ChatGPT was the concept of reinforcement learning. So once they kind of trained the language model and um, had it kind of learn how to do the task, like provided it for the task, they did have a whole bunch of like real humans work with it, test it and provide feedback to further train it. So it's that kind of reinforcement learning that is also super important in making it as good as it already is. Did that make any sense? Let me know. Yeah, it's called um, reinforcement learning from human feedback, which is a newer and like very specific technique. Just pulled up my notes there. What else do we have going on here? Oh, I completely agree with you. Holy cow. Yes. I do not think that AI is the end of art at all. Um, I also think that conversation is, it makes you feel bad uh, a little bit about yourself, but I don't think there's a reason. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a reason to. One of the things that, um, because of all the bias that I just kind of chatted about was you can't take it. You can't really take AI as, um, as like an expert, I guess, or as like a, the only thing as law, it's much better to use it as kind of a tool, um, a, a tool in your toolbox, at least at this point. Um, and one data point in your decision making or one part of your process, because um, it is not perfect as it is. But yes, also, I don't think it's the end of art. And I, I think you make a great point of paperback books existing alongside ebooks. I think, you know, technology is always, always changing. And completely agree with that. Yeah. Nothing to say AI and human artists also can't coincide. I think that is a really good point. Don't think it is either. Things will change. What does, do you mean you think that they, they will change and later? I'm interested in hearing more on your take there, SD Hudson. Artists need to adapt or die. Current discourse of rejected everywhere is going to result in people being left behind. I 100% agree with you. And that's also kind of why um, I did this presentation <laughs> a little bit, even though I am kind of nervous about, I, f I find AI a little bit nerve wracking in terms of just how its environmental impact and how it can perpetuate um, you know, injustice and that kind of thing. But really you do have to kind of engage um, with it at this point because you can't you can't stop progress. That Disney's carousel of progress just keeps on turning. Um, and yes, best to, I completely agree with you on that. Kind of have to embrace it and learn how to work with it and get the best benefit out of it. We don't want to die. No, we don't. We definitely don't. I love that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no worries. Uh, oh, it moved. Okay. <laughs> no worries, Richard. Thank you for jumping back. Yeah, spell checker for writing aid. Yeah, it's a tool. Huzzah. Not anti AI. Just like to hear your own stuff. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I did not talk about at all that I don't really use is, um, 
or I guess you can like I asked the thing to write me an intro scene to my little book idea and I just didn't like it at all. Like it didn't make me feel inspired. It, I was like, oh, I want to write this myself. I don't want you to write it. And I know people who are kind of writing it like very much having it generate text and then editing, editing it. I think that might be a little bit, a little bit too far for me because it kind of takes the fun out of it. And I think that's honestly the most important part for, I mean, it can be whatever you want really, but like, if you like that, keep doing what you like is kind of the, the thing I'm going with now. The ethics. Yeah. The ethics. Yeah. Are you talking kind of about um, copyright and like ownership of content? That's a, that's a big one. Um, it's big in the education industry right now as well. Um, so one of the things here, so copyrights won't apply if AI does most of the work. That's true. Yeah. So the, one of the things I was first worried about when I looked at pseudo right was like who owns the writing that comes out of it, but they clearly state on their website that they, um, they don't claim copyright to it. But like if AI does most of the work, exactly as you said, um, also in preparation for this, I read this little book. It was not worth the money, to be honest. It was about like how to write a book using chat GPT. It was really not worth the money. Um, but basically almost the entire thing that she, that the author had in there was generated. And it's a really great question. If you remember back to, there was a time when um, like AI pictures were really big on Instagram as well. Um, those like portrait avatar type things. Personally, they never looked like me. It, I just could not get it to look like me for the life of me. Um, but yeah, there was a huge controversy over that because they were trained on artists' work and none of those artists were accredited. Assuming that all the art was kind of available on the public internet, but obviously you want, um, a what is it? Accreditation? Retribution? Retri whatever that word is. Nice, sweet. Yeah, you meant about prejudice, <laughs> how it enforces stereotypes and bias, the ethics of stealing millions of protected works to train the models and then compete with them. Yep. Yep. That's so uh, that's there. <laughs> that's an issue for sure. Um, it's interesting. I don't, well, I worked in, um, or my master's was around AI kind of in medicine. And that wasn't a really interesting one because another issue, especially when it comes to, um, not the generative ones, but the, oh, I have two minutes, but the, um, the decision makers is that there's no way to kind of understand how they're making their decisions. If you saw that giant diagram with all the numbers, it's really hard for a human to understand that. I think somehow the AI generates gender stuff bothers you. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Proceed with caution. Attribution, that is the word. I mean, maybe it's a tool. It's an assistant they can use in their practice. But yeah, it's another issue, right? Like if AI gets it wrong and the doctor went with the AI's decision or a diagnosis, who's responsible? Who's liable for that? I don't know. All right. I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you so much, everybody. This is a really good conversation at the end, too. I'm so happy to have gotten the chance to chat with you. Um, if you liked this, please subscribe. If you have a channel, maybe just throw it in there too. I would love to um, come subscribe and hang out with you as well. And let's get ready for the next presentations. Thanks everybody. Huzzah! <laughs> and end.